Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to AI for Good. We hope that all you and your families, your friends, and your colleagues are all keeping healthy and safe. My name is Guillem Martinez Rora from the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, and it is a privilege to introduce today's session. The ITU is a United Nations specialized agency for information and telecommunication technologies, and we are also the organizers of the AI for Good alongside the XPRIZE Foundation in partnership with 38 UN agencies and co convene with Switzerland. The goal of the summit is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the sustainable development goals and a scale those solutions for global impact. We are pleased today to discuss how artificial intelligence power robots can accelerate progress toward the UN SDGs. This will be the first of many AI for Good sessions where we will discuss the role of robotics in achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. But before I introduce today's moderator, let me begin with a couple of housekeeping rules. Your microphone has been disabled, so please use the Q&A and chat functionalities to communicate, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. Please make sure to set the chat message recipient to all panelists and attendees, and not just to all panelists. You can select this above the message box. We have a distinguished set of panelists today, but as always, we are counting on you, the participants, to help create a very interactive session. As speaking to being an interactive session, I have a first challenge for you. Use the chat function and write down where are you connecting from. I go first, Geneva, Switzerland. Well, we have uh, people connecting from London, Belgium, Berkeley, Waterloo, from Canada, uh, Germany, India. So really, uh, Sweden, uh, Barcelona, uh, we, Italy, Denmark, Canada. Well, we, we really have, uh, I cannot keep up. There are so many. We are amazed uh, really to have such an, an international audience. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our great moderator today. Her name is LJ Rich, and she's an inventor and host of the BBC flagship technology show, Click. LJ, welcome, and the show is all yours. Thank you so much, Guillaume, for inviting me and welcome everyone all over the world to this AI and Robotics for Good, advancing the UN Sustainable Development Goals with intelligent robots. Um, so robots have always been heavily depicted in science fiction from the ever helpful C-3PO in Star Wars to Data in Star Trek and the slightly less helpful Terminator and 2001's HAL. Visions of the Future painted a picture of automatons in every house doing mundane tasks giving us humans much needed free time. But robots in our current time are somewhat different to the androids in sci-fi, but they're still very impressive from building cars or helping in hospitals to Perseverance, a robot that can actually fly on other planets. And there's even more to robotics when teamed with AI. Building devices to support humans in reaching the sustainable development goals is now a possibility from healthcare to decarbonisation. Hardware, material and computational innovation is spawning more and more devices being used to augment human discovery. With that said, today's panel is going to be fantastic. Our guests will help us explore this fascinating subject and we'll look to the future together as well as understanding the issues happening right now. Joining me on the panel today will be Dr. Saeed Zahre, Robotics Head of Innovation at ABB, Dr. Alice M. Agogino, Roscoe and Elizabeth Hughes Chair in Mechanical Engineering at UC Berkeley, and CEO and CTO at Squishy Robotics, Dr. Andrea Tomas, CEO and co-founder at Diligent Robotics and Associate Professor at the University of Texas at Austin, and Dr. Henrik Christensen, Qualcomm Chancellor's Chair of Robot Systems and Professor of Computer Science and engineering at UC San Diego. 
Now, we plan to run this session by inviting opening remarks from each panellist to set the scene. Then we'll expand into a panel discussion with everyone. And this can include you, if you wish. Audience, you'll notice the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. Please add any questions you have there and we'll hopefully have time to answer a few of them after our speakers. Talking of which, it's time to go to our first of four from Diligent Robotics and Associate Professor at the University of Texas in Austin, telling us how robots can help us in hospitals and beyond. Please welcome Dr. Andrea Thomas. Hello, thank you so much. This is very exciting to be here on this panel and I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Um, just sharing my screen really quick. Um, yeah, I'm Andrea Tomas, CEO and co-founder of Diligent Robotics, and I'm excited to introduce you to you know, the ways that we're building robots that are uh, making an impact in hospitals and healthcare and how you know, I think the kinds of robots that we need to build to really you know, have a big impact in these, in these areas. So this is our robot Moxie that I'll tell you a little bit about, but to back up a little bit, um, Diligent Robotics is founded by myself and my co-founder Vivian Chu. And you know, we are roboticists that have, you know, I did my PhD at MIT and then uh, Vivian did her PhD at Georgia Tech. And you know, part of what we think about a lot is human robot interaction and how we can build robots that are actually able to to be deployed and, and work every day side by side with people. Uh, because I think that's gonna be some of the most exciting ways that, that AI and robotics are going to be able to you know, truly impact really important areas of our lives. So you know, one of the ways that I you know, like to think about it is you know, right, right now today, most people won't run into any robots in your life. You're gonna kind of go about your day and you probably won't see any robots, but um, pretty soon that's not gonna be the case. And I think it's gonna be you know, really exciting Exciting to see the ways that that these um, automation is going to be able to come in and make a really big impact in our lives. Um, so, in particular, the the area that that Diligent is really passionate about using AI and robotics to impact is healthcare and hospitals, in particular. You know, right now, our, our our company is based in the U.S. and we're you know really um, our customer base is in the U.S. But this need is very much uh, a worldwide need where there's a shortage of clinicians and um, skilled skilled nurses and skilled um, clinicians to you know work in our hospitals and there's increasing challenges you know, the the COVID-19 pandemic has really only stressed the system even more. Um, but when you look at the when you look at it, it's it's very um, it's very ripe for automation because when you um, visit a hospital and you kind of start to you know, follow a clinician or a nurse around on their day-to-day -day activities, there's a lot of manual delivery and fetching of items and just materials management of you know getting things where they need to be in order for people to be able to do the patient care that they need to do. And so that's really the opportunity that we are building robots for at Diligent Robotics. And um, I can introduce you to our, our product. Um, so this is Moxie. Um, Moxie is a mobile manipulation robot. So that's just kind of a general term in robotics for robots that have a, a mobile base, but then also an arm that can manipulate things in the environment. And so that's a really important piece of the puzzle for us as we you know, truly believe that having both the, the mobility component to do transport tasks, but also the manipulation capability um, have unlocks a, a lot more potential. And so we're focused on you know, you know, the AI and um, perception algorithms that really allow the robot to move around the environment in a safe and effective way. Um, but another thing that we think a lot about is how this robot works right next to, you know, really busy people in a stressful environment. And so, um, so part of what we really think about is the social intelligence and the social expressiveness that this robot can have. Um, so you'll see it has an LED face and can um, move its head actually. Um, and that ends up being really important for the interactions that the robot can have in the environment with people. 
people. Um, and it's really simple, even from, you know, do you think, you know, the robot's coming down the hallway and it's getting to a juncture and is it going to turn left or right? And so with people, we're very used to, you know, watching people's body movements and, and being able to infer what they're going to do. So we try to infer what people are about to do. And so if the robot looks to the left before it turns left or you know looks down at the table before it tries to grab something this really helps everyone in the environment um, understand what the robot's about to do so so these kind of social cues we think are really important um, and you know backed by you know years of research when um you know back in the research lab we would show you know studies that would show that a person collaborating with a robot was able to get a task done you know 50% faster because they were able to kind of infer and, and get intuition about the robot, what the robot was about to do. Um, okay, so I will tell you a little bit about exactly what Moxie's doing. So we do a lot of delivery tasks in hospitals. So right now in, um, these are again a lot of tasks that are based on uh, U.S. hospitals, but you know, in our discussions with hospitals worldwide, these are pretty universal. That you know, there's centralized places where you know lab equipment or lightweight equipment or medications are in kind of centralized locations around the hospital. But then you really need to get a lot of things out to these patient care units, and um, every day there tends to be you know several different kind of one-off deliveries that fall onto the plate of a clinician. And so that's a, that's exactly what we're doing it day in and day out. And um, there's, you know, several different sizes of secured containers that um, staff members can ask Moxie to bring things from point A to point B. Um, so I can show just a little video of this is Moxie kind of going down the hallway. You see that one of the things that we're really focused on is being able to use the existing infrastructure so that hospitals don't have to install special um, elevators or install special doors that a you know, manipulating arm can really um, push buttons and, and get around in the hallway. Um, the perception algorithms you know, are able to deal with somebody coming around the hallway. The planning algorithms are able to you know, make a decision about how to get to a particular spot to help a, a, a nurse like this. And then she can you know, badge into the container and send a delivery off on its way. Um, and just a little look um, under the hood. So this is pretty um, standard um, indoor navigation technologies or use a LIDAR and an RGBD camera to build a map of the environment. And so here you see the world like Moxie sees the world and you build up a map of the environment. And now like after getting installed and building a map, the robot can autonomously navigate um, throughout the entire hospital and build a plan for how to get uh, to point A from point A to point B. Um, but I was mentioning the importance of manipulation. And so even if you think about just transport tasks in a hospital, just getting items from point A to point B, you might think of that as just a mobility task. But here is a, kind of an early example at one of our hospitals, like just getting from one side of a hospital to the other, the robot has to do, you know, four very different kinds of manipulation actions to, you know, sometimes you have to press a button to open a door and sometimes you have to you know, swipe a badge that we have installed in the wrist and the robot has to um, bring that badge over to this badge reader and that opens the door. But you know, sometimes the, the badge reader is on the other side and the robot has to you know, reach over to the other side. So um, you know, people think about manipulation and robots as always being kind of pick and place actions where the robot's like picking something up and taking it somewhere. But you know, when you think about human environments, you know, there's all kinds of ways that we're manipulating with our with our arms just to you know get around in the world, and so that's a, a big part of what we've learned and what we're focused on. Um, I'll just share as a kind of wrap up on my intro. Um, some of the things that we hear from the nursing staff that get to work with Moxie is you know, really around a lot of comments about being a teammate and um, being helpful and lots of thankfulness, but also just being able to articulate the, the value of having a, a robot run things around and be able to stay with their patient. Like, thank you. I was able to you know, stay here in the ICU. I didn't have to run down to get that IV bag. 
bag. Um, so that's really kind of why we're doing what we're doing and, and um, the impact that I think we can have on, on hospitals and patient care. So with that, I think I will turn it back to you, LJ. Thanks very much, Andrea Thomas. A great start. And from inside hospitals, it's time to venture a little further outside. How robots can help humans going into hazardous environments. It's time to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Alice M. Agogino. Are you there? We're just going to wait for her to turn on her camera. There we go. And microphone. Yes, thank you. Can Wonderful. You yes, we can. We're looking forward to it. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, LJ, for uh, introducing me. And let me see if my slides show. Do they show? Yes, they do. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, as pointed out, my name is Alice Egagino, and I'm CEO of Squishy Robotics. I also have a faculty appointment at the University of California at Berkeley. Squishy Robotics is a company I started as a spinoff from NASA. We provide life-saving, cost-saving information in real time through our rapidly deployable mobile sensor robots. We work on a wide range of customer markets. We started with first responders for disaster response, then military, and we're moving into working with electric utilities, petrochemical plants, and smart cities. Today, I'll present our work on disaster response and early detection of wildfires and methane leaks, all relate to disaster reduction and resiliency that are very much needed to fight climate change today. Disaster risk reduction is an integral part of the social and economic development that is essential to achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So Squishy Robotics is a spin-off of work that I did with NASA and space exploration in building planetary probes. We were to drop our robot from the orbit or be shot out of a secondary robot, uh, robot, survive the impact with delicate sensors inside and then conduct scientific research. On planet Earth, Squishy Robotics has an innovative solution that provides time critical data when and where it's needed. And I'll give a, a sample use case that motivated us. This chlorine tanker derailment happened in the dead of night. The first responders didn't know what they were walking into and didn't realize that that tanker was transporting deadly chlorine gas. As a result of this poor situation awareness, there were nine fatalities and over 600 injuries. This is how Squishy Robotics comes to the rescue. Our sensor robots can be rapidly deployed by aerial vehicles. You see in the left a drone, but we've been dropped by helicopter and fixed wing aircraft as well. Uh, we've tested them at drops of over 300 meters. They can survive the landing and continue to submit critical data to first responders even before they arrive so that they can know and prepare for what they are walking into. So I'll show a video of Squishy Robotics in action. This is our work on a training exercise with the LA County Fire Department. Our robot is being dropped by a drone into a simulated hazardous emergency caused by an overturned truck on the freeway. And you can see the drone carrying and then dropping squishy robotics. Emergency responders are then able to view the chemical sensor data and the video feed from a safe distance. So what do first responders do today? Well, current hazmat response often requires responders to suit up in those bulky suits you see in the right and hand carry sensors to probably assess and plan the response. It can take up to 90 minutes to prepare. And while they are doing this, they're exposing themselves and the local community to danger. Another use case that we're looking at is early detection of wildland fires that could also save lives and billions of dollars worth of damage. Consider the Butte County wildfire in California. There were 86 deaths, $16 billion worth of damage and huge negative impact on climate change. In fact, it turned around all the advances California had in the previous year. This fire could likely have been contained earlier if the utility had used squishy robotics for early detection of fault and wildfires. 
we've begun to test our robots on prescribed burns events and real life scenarios, as you see in this video. Our robots are rapidly deployed again by drones and are uniquely able to be inserted into an austere wildland environment, which is where many of the wildland fires occur. We have developed a sensor payload specifically intended to detect early incipient wildfires. If properly deployed into a defensible space, the robot is designed to detect and monitor wildfires in early stages, and they can even survive a grass fire. We didn't intend to do it, but one of our robots actually fell into a fire and was able to be able to submit data even as the fire was raging around it. Squishy Robotics provides a much needed solution to disaster response. Our sensor robots are impact resistant. They can be deployed in fleets. So we've dropped several robots from one drone. They provide 360 degree vision and can carry um, personalized and customized sensing solution payloads. Squishy Robotics provides these customized sensing uh, payloads for the use cases that I talked about, but we're open to using our engineering to look at new use cases. As shown in the middle, we also uh, deliver third party payloads such as the communication device, long distance radio showed in the center. And on the right, we show us monitoring and data as a service for uh, petrochemical companies and electric utilities. Our distributed computing architecture blends edge computing on the robot itself and on a computer for visualizing the data locally and data fusion to support data informed decisions in the cloud in real time with the ability to create mesh networks. Cloud computing and machine learning will improve our data analytics over time. With this architecture, we can fuse the data from local sensors in industrial and smart city applications and then optimally place new sensors as needed using our AI algorithms. This architecture is currently being expanded for methane detection, which is responsible. Recent uh, intergovernmental UN report showed that um, methane is the cause of 25% of today's global warming with bigger impact than carbon dioxide pound for pound. Our architecture approach that takes advantage of satellite data to identify drone deployment locations, then moves on to optimally place our sensor robots to find the exact solution of a leak. As you can see in the picture, uh, many of these leaks occur in remote areas and you don't know, the satellite data gives just maybe general acres, but is only have maybe a mile or two resolution of where the actual source is. And so what we do is we try to use our data analytics to be able to identify the source of the leak and try to get closer to be able to gain more information about what's actually happening with the leak. We're using multimodal sensing strategies, multi-agent collaboration, and AI data analytics to do things like distinguish faulty equipment and what that equipment is from legal emissions and then prioritize a plan for repair if needed. Looking to the future, this is our product platform roadmap. We are testing our stationary robots with customers now, as you see on the left. And in the lab, we're testing our mobile robot in the lab and the field. We've started a program for testing fire detection and prevention. And we're performing research and development with Dr. Mark Muller from UC Berkeley to create an aerial ground hybrid system by putting rotors on the rod or rotors within the robot itself so that we can get air man maneuverability. We're, as I said, we're working on optimal placement of sensors for methane detection for future implementations. So I'll end with this montage of outtakes from Squishy Robotics as a spin-off from my NASA research for planetary exploration, we are now working on planet Earth with the largest and most influential fire departments in the United States to provide life-saving, cost-saving information in real time through our rapidly deployable mobile sensor robots. We've conducted extensive user testing and feedback with our pilot partners, and we are working with leaders in integrating drones into emergency response. We also deliver payloads such as communication devices to the military. And our partners are extraordinary. 
Southern Manatee Fire and Rescue, for example, as shown here, won the Drone Responders Outstanding Public Safety Drone Award Program of the Year. We continue to innovate with new robot configurations, such as our shape-shifting mobile robot and rotor robot with ground and air maneuverability. We test our research in the field on different types of rough terrain. And here we see us testing in the lab on a mobile robot for uh, a obstacle avoidance using our AI path planning algorithms. And finally, we are expanding and our capabilities for early detection of wildland fires and methane detection. So it's all AI for good. So with that final video, just wanna thank you for the opportunity to present. I look forward to the discussion. Squishy Robotics provides life-saving, cost-saving information in real time through our rapidly deployable mobile sensor robots. Wow, thank you so much to Alice Agugino. A fascinating insight into how robots can boldly go to help humans in dangerous places. Next up, we're going to find out a little about how businesses choose which technology to invest in with our third speaker, Robotics Head of Innovation at ABB. It's Dr. Saeed Zahrae. Thank you very much, uh, LJ. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, let me try to share my screen. Um, Hope that everything is okay. Uh, do you see my screen? We can indeed. Okay, very good. Um, I'm very happy to be uh, with you today uh, in this webinar and uh, show you some examples uh, uh, where our robots and AI try to make life uh, better for us. Uh, we have uh, been around for about 50 years. We are parents of electrical robots which were born uh, uh, at the beginning of 1974. And since that time, robots have been spread out to many different areas and uh, uh, market segments. During these uh, 50 years, uh, not only robots have uh, uh, been developed, but also tools and infrastructure that are needed to make them uh, usable. Uh, today, uh, we see a high interest and needs uh, in uh, healthcare, retails, and logistics. And we believe that with the new products that uh, we are bringing to the market, we are going to see a fast growth in those areas. I'm going to show you five different examples from different uh, uh, segments. Uh, but before we go there, I want to uh, show you what we mean by AI. You are going to sell robots, but AI is difficult to see. Uh, basically, we can say that AI helps us to find uh, shapes and objects that are difficult to describe by mathematical formulas. Uh, cats and dogs are, of course, uh, such shapes, but uh, uh, we have uh, many other situations in uh, uh, industry. For example, finding objects, uh, looking at the weld uh, um, profiles, or even predicting it. So there we use AI. My first example to show you is uh, uh, AI immunizer. It's a system that was developed to accelerate the uh, uh, COVID vaccine development. Uh, the system has the two robots. The left one is uh, trying to find antibodies uh, that uh, um, have a, a good neutralization effect uh, on the uh, virus. An AI system is analyzing the result. And for those candidates that have given good result, uh, the second robot here is making um, uh, basically volume testing. This robot, uh, uh, you see that it works with equipment uh, which is made for human hand. That is uh, helping to easily adapt it. Uh, this is a, a repetitive uh, uh, procedure that is taken care of by a robot. It does the work faster, more accurate, but maybe most importantly reduces uh, the infection risks to a human professional. Uh, once we have it in place, uh, it's not only for COVID, but we have a, a platform for vaccine development. This platform thinking we can see in uh, other places as well. For example, for uh, painting of uh, car bodies. Uh, robots have been used for uh, uh, painting of cars for a very long time. Uh, when you see that a, a car is painted, it's a spray which is coming out, so the uh, air is contaminated and uh, not healthy for uh, people. 
robots take care of that. And in addition, they reduce waste, cost, energy, and lower the impact on the environment. With latest uh, uh, digitalization, uh, we have been able to improve uh, even further. But robots are very accurate. What can we do with that accuracy? Here we have our uh, uh, recent product, we call it Pixel Paint, which allows uh, the customer to choose to print a certain pattern uh, on the car. Here is the booth. Uh, you are going to see that uh, even when uh, the painting starts, uh, it's clean uh, and nice. The paint is not sprayed, but it's uh, printed uh, on the body. As a result, the efficiency is very high, the losses are very low, and um, uh, the impact on the environment is going to be much less. So in addition to those uh, positive effects, we have a full customization as well. Next example that I have uh, moves us to another segment, uh, construction. It's the Shield-Res uh, uh, RISE, Robotic Installation System for Elevators. Uh, RISE works uh, in uh, elevator shafts and prepares for mounting the guide rails. It first scans the wall, uh, as you see here, and then after that, uh, it looks through the concrete to look for the rebars. Once it has found the right place to drill a hole, it goes there and it drills the hole. After uh, drilling the hole, it uh, picks a, a, a bolt and uh, hammers it in the hole, and then it moves forward uh, to the next level. Uh, this area is an uh, area which is in a a uh, strong need of automation. Uh, automation allows us to uh, make the environment uh, more friendly for the uh, workers and make the job uh, uh, more attractive. In addition, uh, we see that uh, uh, automation can help us, uh, helps to reduce the waste from the whole construction. Housing and uh, construction is one aspect of life. Uh, another aspect is of course the uh, waste handling. We need to take care of the waste that uh, uh, we have in our society. Here we have a, a robotic uh, uh, recycling system. It uses a vision AI to uh, find uh, objects that are passing and they recycle them correctly or classify them correctly and recycle them. In this example, we have only vision, but uh, uh, in a real case, uh, we are going to have uh, more sensors and with sensor fusion, we can have very accurate and detailed uh, uh, classification of uh, trash pieces. My last example uh, is again from uh, healthcare. Um, but uh, uh, the reason that I'm showing here uh, this example is a little bit different. One is that it's a project that uh, we are very proud of being a part of. And the secondly is that it shows a different aspect of uh, robotics. It shows how fast a business can switch to new circumstances. Uh, let us listen to Mr. Charles Boyce, president of Boyce Technologies in New York, and hear what has happened. My name is Charles Boyce. I'm the president of Boyce Technologies. We build life, safety, security, and communications equipment for the mass transit. driving to work and listening to the radio and the ventilator issue just wasn't going away. I came to work that day and sat with my engineers. They're used to this. And I said, we're gonna build ventilators. We had to develop something that was manufacturable, but we also had to retool our factory to do that. And I remember calling ABB and um, uh, completely deranged. I mean, you know, in the, in the wee hours of the morning, people really weren't sleeping. And I said, you know, you've got to get me robots. I knew that the solution to this, if we were going to mass produce thousands of something quickly, we really had to rely on, uh, on robots. Robots don't replace people. What's really amazing is that when you give somebody robots that they have to learn how to program them and what it does to elevate their expertise is, is truly amazing. 
Voice Technologies is the only non-medical manufacturing company to produce a bridge ventilator in less than a month and go to mass production. We couldn't do that without the partnerships like that we have with ABB. We're really proud to have uh, had the, uh, the responsibility to develop something that, that will change lives. Uh, yeah, you heard from uh, Mr. Boyce that uh, uh, they succeeded to uh, go from idea to mass production of 300 ventilators per day in less than 30 days. Uh, this is an uh, impressive short time for uh, coming to a new business and uh, uh, starting to deliver products to the customers. This time was uh, for a very good uh, reason. We are proud of being able to support, uh, uh, support them with our products, tools, and knowledge that we have. I come to the end of my uh, presentation. I want to end with uh, this uh, um, uh, tweet from Bill Gates. He basically says that uh, we are moving forward. We make our world uh, a better place to live. Uh, I hope that we continue that way. We take care of each other and we take care of our planet in such a way so that our children and our grandchildren, maybe 30, 40 years from now, can also say the same thing. By that, my presentation is finished. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hand it over back to you, LJ. Thank you so much, Saeed Zahre. An amazing array of robots from construction and car making, waste handling to ventilator manufacturing. My goodness. Well, we're going to expand even further now into mapping major forest fires and more with Qualcomm Chancellor's Chair of Robot Systems and Professor of Computer Science and Engineering at UC San Diego. Please welcome Dr. Henrik L. Christensen. Hi, LJ. Hi there. Uh, let's see if I can do screen sharing. Here we go. So with a little bit of luck. So thank you uh, very much for thank you very much for inviting me uh, to talk about this. I'm going to take a slightly broader perspective on on this and try and cover it. So so my uh, background for this is that uh, as the principal officer of the U.S. National Robotics Roadmap, we try every four years to sort of look at where is the world going in terms of manufacturing services, healthcare, logistics, and space. Uh, so I want to use this as sort of a my background for, for the opening remarks on where do we see uh, the impact of robotics in, in sort of a broader sense, both in terms of sort of economic growth, deployment, how do we feed the planet, uh, how do we address some of the climate change issues that we have with forest fires in California and elsewhere, how do we address some of the healthcare? Uh, so I'll do sort of a broad brush over this to give you a sense for uh, this. A question I get, which is very similar to what Saeed was getting is, you know, why robots? Robots, uh, is there still room for people? Uh, and most people don't realize the most highly automated factories we have today, there's one robot for every 10 people. So lights out factories are, not sort of around the corner. So we see this confluence of human and robots is sort of essential for us to be able to make progress for the future. So we need this. And, and to do this, we went down and did some statistical analysis on this. And uh, the blue curve is so, so showing the number of robots being sold in the US, uh, industrial robots. Uh, and the yellow one is showing the employment of people in manufacturing. And you can see there's a very strong correlation. So we see this globally. Whenever people do investments in robotics, it is also when they're actually employing more people. So as we are going through this sort of significant economic growth curve we're seeing right now, we are both seeing more employment, but we are also seeing significant robotic sales. So that's an example of how manufacturing is actually facilitating economic growth worldwide. Another area where we're seeing this is, of course, in terms of feeding the planet. So we've been working with um, wineries, but also strawberry farmers uh, in California to understand how can we do better automation? How can we develop a better product? How can we develop one where you use less pesticides, less water, and still deliver a, a better product? So we're seeing now, for instance, some wineries are down to only using two to three gallons of water for every tree, which is amazing because use of technology sort of enables this. We're also seeing that we can use this for going out and do much better monitoring of this so that you can do just-in-time harvesting, 
And this, so this is an example of where we use drones for some of the monitoring and we use ground-based robots to actually go out and reduce the amount of pesticides. We can pick it just in time using sort of the latest technology, both in terms of doing grasp and in terms of doing per perception. In terms of climate issues, one of the interesting things, one of the things that shouldn't really be surprising to you is that computers are better drivers than people. So we did a significant study uh, with both some automotive and some truck companies. And it turns out that autonomous driving trucks are five to save sort of five to 8% fuel compared to manually driven trucks. So this is a very significant environmental impact. So we see trucks driving coast to coast in the US. We see this going through Europe. I used to live where E4 was driving from Frederick Sound all the way to Lisbon. And there, if you can save five to 8% fuel, this is a very significant impact on this. So we are seeing not only are we getting smarter cars, but we are also using this to get a significant reduction in the environmental impact. We can use this for much better cleanup. We here at UCSD uh, work with the Scripps Institute of Oceanography on doing cleanup of the oceans from plastic using robotics, using underwater vehicles to be able to go out and do this in a way that is much more efficient than we've been able to do before. So that's actually very exciting. We are uh, also using this to find better ways of improving the quality of, uh, of housing for this. Another area where we're seeing a tremendous progress is in access to healthcare. So with access to healthcare, uh, we've recently done studies where we can send a surgeon more or less anywhere in the world. So if there's a need for an expertise, you can do sort of bedside consultations using augmented reality, virtual reality, but also even for surgery. So we've recently done some experiments to show that if there is a ship in the middle of the ocean and you need access to a specialist surgeon, you can actually do this using this technology. So having robotic technology in the combination with AI enables us to have much more universal access to healthcare, which is truly exciting that we're getting out there to, to everybody. Another area where we're seeing this is we're seeing sensing, uh, perception, modeling of the world also enables us to go in and look at. So here's a small example of where we're doing cultural heritage. So we've been traveling the world uh, using drones, using our camera technology to build 3D models of monasteries of important cultural heritage. Uh, so, uh, oh, I didn't want to show you uh, the entire, uh, so, but basically we can go in and build sort of a, a 3D model of complete buildings. And we've seen in some areas of the world where you might have uh, conflicts that cultural values are actually being uh, ruined. Here is a possibility of at least going out and making sure that if that happens, we can actually save them for uh, the future. So we, we've done this uh, in, in Syria, we've done this in, in Israel, we've done this in Northern Africa. So it's very important that we also think about how can we actually use this technology to make sure that we preserve our history for the future of the planet. Uh, so, uh, so in summary, I think we can bring together these techniques to have very, very broad impact in terms of climate, in terms of this. Uh, LJ mentioned it when we started. Right now, we're using drones to fly over the forests in California to do the tracking. So you can actually go to Cal Fire and you can see where are all of the potential fires. And we can do live updates to fire trucks so they know exactly where the fires are, where they need to reallocate uh, their resources in such a way that it's much more efficient. They used to do this on paper where they literally sketched out where the fires were and they would fax out this. Today, we can do live monitoring of this. So technology has a huge impact, but at the same time, I think it's very important. We need to figure out how do we broaden it out so that it's accessible to everybody. And for that reason, as you've also seen in chat, we need the research and the development. We also need the education to make sure that we get sort of into the hands of everybody. And finally, we make to, need to make sure it gets translated into something that everybody can use. And with that, I'll hand it back to LJ. 
Brilliant. Thank you, Dr. Henrik Christensen. And I'd like to invite all the panellists to join us for the start of our Q&A session. Audience, thank you so much for your questions. Please keep them coming. Put them into the Q&A section and we'll try to get to a few of those too. For the fast typists among our panel, you are, if you are inclined, welcome to answer questions by typing. And I'm going to start with a question for Dr. Alice as well. So if you'd like to turn on your camera and microphone, that would be amazing. The first question then to you will be, how will early detection of wildfires improve our battle with climate change? Well, the state of California, when we had the campfire and then the most recent uh, fires, had made much progress in reducing greenhouse gases. But all of the benefits were lost because of all the carbon that went up in the air with the wildfires. So there's a very strong connection between wildfires and, and negative impact on climate change. What we were looking at with the electric utilities is the early detection of fires. They may get, um, the utilities in California, for example, have started something like 3000 fires due to faulty equipment. And the problem is, they know that there's a signal, they know that there's an anomaly, but they just don't have the people power to send someone out to identify what's happening. With the campfire two years ago, they did send an aerial vehicle out to try to detect what was happening with that transmission line, but it came back and didn't see anything. There wasn't enough precision or persistence in what they were looking at to be able to detect whether that transmission line had actually started a fire. It was the dead of night, so maybe you know they hadn't seen it. Maybe the fire hadn't started. Um, our our strategy is for early detection is to get there early and often, make it easy for the electric utilities to send us out, and then drop and persistently monitor. There have been other wildfires. The Oakland wildfire in I think 1991 had a similar situation. They thought they had put the fire out but they didn't leave anything to monitor what was going on. And that's the connection between the early monitoring of wildfires because you wanna prevent the wildfire from starting and monitor it to make sure it doesn't become larger. Brilliant, thank you very much. Uh, next up, let's have a question for Andrea. Do you have any specific customer stories that have stayed with you? I know you mentioned a few at the end of your presentation, but are there any others that, that really stand out? Yeah, let's see. Um, I mean, I think it's it's always fascinating to get to visit a customer client site and and just watch. Uh, you can you can kind of follow thirty or forty feet behind Moxie and and you see um, you know, nurses kind of come by. Oh, hey, Moxie, how's it going? Oh, we're really busy today. Really need your help up on the third floor. Um, so that's always kind of fun to see how integrated into the team the robot has become. Um, but I think some of the stories that stick with me are the ones where um, you, so there's one nurse that would talk about uh, when we first, you know, about a month after implementing Moxie at their hospital, they were just talking about like, wow, it's, it's amazing. I used to worry about, you know, going and getting the telemetry box whenever I had a new admission and it was a very stressful thing that I had to do. And now I just don't think about that anymore. Like Moxie does that. I don't have to think about it. And so that, that idea that they're able to kind of um, just reduce that cognitive burden and give a whole like piece of the work over to, to Moxie has been uh, really interesting to see. Wow. And what have been some of the challenges? What's your sort of next version of Moxie going to have? Oh, I mean, there's some, there's like a really long wish list of things that, that everyone would love for the, the robot to do. So I think point to point transport is just one, uh, just scratching the surface. Um, you know, we're looking at how the robot can really assist in um, some of the materials management around surgical services. So you, know, you see a lot of robots in the, you know, there's surgical robots that are like literally in the OR, um, but there's just, a, there's a a lot of other ways that, that the surgical services can be um, uh, assisted with automation. So we're looking at that. Wow, thank you. All right, a question now for Saeed. Where specifically, i.e. which industries, which areas, do you see AI enabled robots used in the future where robots are not currently used? You had a, a great video of the car being printed and we're quite used to seeing um, robots being used to assemble cars or, or paint them in that case. So do you think there are areas in the future where we will start to see more robots? 
Uh, well, uh, I think uh, it's a little bit difficult to find a segment on the market where no robots are used. So uh, they are there, maybe not so many. Uh, I think uh, um, from one perspective is that uh, uh, this kind of uh, collaborative robots uh, that uh, uh, can come close to people, they have a strong uh, benefit of having AI that reacts to uh, people in a cognitive way. They are going to be spread out almost everywhere, I guess. Uh, if we, uh, we earlier mentioned, or I earlier mentioned uh, um, healthcare, I think that is an area where uh, the need is there. Uh, we have not come uh, very far. One because that uh, uh, because of safety reasons. Another one because uh, the environment is not ready for uh, robots. AI facilitates there. Uh, I mentioned the construction. I would say that uh, I will be very happy to see that uh, farming has more advantage of robots. It would be really uh, fun to come to a situation that uh, we have uh, shortened it um, uh, from the farm to the table to maybe 24 hours. Then I guess uh, uh, the food will taste much different than what it does today. Mm, I think there's some there's such a lot of innovation that goes on right at the the very beginning of farming. I visited India where somebody had set up a SIM card to tell him when the fields needed irrigating. It, they'd set up a SIM card and a sensor. So there's always, I think, space for technology in innovation, even right down there on the ground. Um, I'd like to bring Dr. Henrik in here, actually, please. Um, how do we make sure that these advances of AI and robotics that we're seeing don't just benefit the industrialized world. How do we do this for good for everyone? Big question there for you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, good question. So I, I think it's very important that we think about how do we make sure that we make this accessible to everyone. And, and step number one is, of course, to figure out how do we educate people about this technology in such a way that, that they can build it locally. It's unrealistic to assume that we can send it from the industrialized world to to these places. So it's very encouraging to see, for instance, in Africa, there is now a network of educational institutions that's coming together to figure out how can they leverage this? How can we leverage sort of a do it yourself type of movement to enable them to do this locally? And for me, the technology is moving so fast because of cheap 3D printers and other things, we can have people do, do this that was sort of unimaginable before. The same we're sort of seeing people that have cell phones, uh, you know, they might not have an internet connection, they barely have electricity, but they have access to a cell phone. We can use these technologies to do it. So I think it's very important that we do, we do podcasts, we do use all of the social media to make sure that we can discriminate it. I haven't figured out yet, is there a TikTok channel for robotics, you know, so, but, but we need to figure out how do we get it out there? How do we make it exciting for things? And there we, we're seeing an academic network, we're seeing uh, sort of organizations like the first organization that's trying to build robots all over the world. So it's a number of these that, that I think is very important because if we don't have the human capital, we can be as progressive as we want to be, it's not gonna get accepted. So, so I think this of uh, building a do-it-yourself network will help us do this and then provide the good examples for what we can do. So during COVID, as an example, we actually reorganized resources for something we call co-respond, where anybody in the world could send questions to us about how do I address PPE questions? So how do I address, you know, is glasses a good safety mechanism? Or what can I do if I take this medication? And we had 600 medical students that couldn't go to class. So they became our crowdsourcing solution for providing answers to all of these and to make it accessible to everybody on a cell phone. You can go in, there's an application for Doctors Without Borders, and we use this. So now there are 500, 600 recipes on there. How can you address COVID? We used to do the same thing in robotics. How can we make this accessible on platforms so that there's no barrier for them to have access to knowledge? Lowering barriers to knowledge is definitely something I can get behind. Thank you very much. Let's go to a few audience questions that we have here. One is sort of a little bit, um, I'm going to um, offer this to Andrea. It's a little bit like what we were talking about during our rehearsal about how much you need to 
get the hospital ready for the robot to be able to move around. So this question here, how large are environment dependencies? What do you need to install or make sure a hospital building provides to make it easier for a robot to re perform reliably and consistent, consistently even? And, and how would you approach this? So there we go. Nice big question for you. That's a great question. I, and, and really, it is uh, very, very much around like what state of the art AI and robotics can achieve now compared to what, you know, technology may have been able to do, you know, 10 or 20 years ago is that, you know, we are able to install robots and have them, you know, be able to be doing um, mobile manipulation tasks pretty quickly and without very much infrastructure being installed at all. And so that's one of the things that we really, you know, work towards is being able to have robots that can just make use of the existing infrastructure um, and, you know, through machine learning techniques and an ad adaptation to the environment, um, yeah. I mean, there's just so many different things that we could ask you in this case, and I feel like we've only got a certain amount of time, so I'm going to do my best to get across most of you. <laughs> All right, so I have another question for um, Dr. Saeed. As we are looking to the future here, what do you think comes next? Where is robotics going to go next? If we're already working at this level today, what happens when we start integrating AI further into robotics? Uh, difficult question. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, first thing is that uh, uh, robots, as I said before, robots come closer to human. Uh, this uh, means that uh, a, a number of new uh, applications will be open. So, for example, if you come to the healthcare now, we are talking about uh, uh, robots walking around, but uh, maybe robots can come closer to human and, for example, help uh, uh, the uh, healthcare uh, personnel to lift people and so on. Uh, I think uh, uh, the big uh, um, area that uh, uh, we will see, where we will see robots uh, uh, someday in the future is retail. Uh, today, uh, I don't think there are so many places where you can go and see robots going around and uh, serving you. That uh, will happen. Uh, Again, we have a situation that uh, people should uh, be able to come to robots or the other way, robots should be able to come to people without hurting them. And that should be safe enough so that uh, the owner of the business can really go for that. Uh, we are on good way to that direction. Uh, and I think that is going to happen soon. Brilliant, thank you very much. Uh, I've got a question for Alice here. Um, how do you think early detection of methane leaks can improve our battle with climate change? Are there incentives for the oil and gas companies to comply beyond the obvious environmental aspect? Uh, that's an excellent question. And there have been some recent legal changes that make it very attractive for industry to get early detection of methane. The industry is pretty good on their main plants. The problem is in, in remote regions and just having the people power to go out and do those inspections frequently. It turns out that 50% of the methane that they sell actually goes out into the air because of these leaks. So they're losing money right now in inefficiency. But there are new regulations such as uh, with the European Union that wants to show the provenance of the national, natural gas that they purchase and wants to show that the company they're purchasing natural gas from has the proper um, equipment in place and procedures in place to prevent methane detection. So there's increasing, with the recognition of this intergovernment report on the impact of methane leaks on climate change, there's been an increased regulation as well that makes it attractive for companies to speed up their methane detection program. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask a broad question now to everybody, just based on one of the questions from our audience here, which is about training. How can we, um, oh, there we go. Do we have training for educators for robotics, for SDGs, or any areas or websites or resources that you think would be quite interesting to somebody wanting to either get educated or learn more or be able to teach some of these uh, I'd, I'd like to respond to that, actually. I, sure. I, uh, I wanted to, you know, to 
reiterate what Henrik talked about in developing regions. I think it's really important to understand context and understand what local needs are and what the opportunities are for capacity building. And one of the things I've done at UC Berkeley is worked with our faculty to start a program called development engineering. And part of that program is to combine science and technology with social science, economics for better business models and sociology, anthropology. And one big theme that we have is digital technologies for development. And in that program, we're working with people from developing regions that are part of our master's and PhD program with educational materials. And then also with our own students to work in contextual applications for these digital transformations. And I do think if done properly through a co-design process, not just pushing technology down, there's much that we can do to make these technologies available more broadly in developing regions. Brilliant, thank you. Saeed, I know you want to come in and then Henrik, I'll come to you afterwards. Yes, uh, uh, I think uh, if uh, you're interested in learning about uh, our robots and uh, how to build system uh, uh, with them, you can easily find all information uh, on the network. Uh, there are uh, training material, you can even use our tools to learn uh, uh, how to do the work. Um, I, uh, I would say that today you will need a computer, but that is also something that will change very soon. We will come soon to a level that uh, practically may, uh, you can do everything uh, on your phone. Of course, it's not uh, uh, as easy because you have a smaller uh, 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 screen, but that will be possible. That helps, of course, uh, uh, to take steps towards a really democrati re democratization of robotics. Anyone, any place in the world can learn uh, about robotics and also related to that, offer his or her services to those who can have benefit of that. Thank you, Saeed. Henrik? So, so, so I think the question is incredibly broad in terms of of this, so, so it's very important that we think about what can we do for uh, regular education for K-12 to actually get down there uh, and, and do start. So, you know, one of the arguments is that if you don't catch the interest of girls by sort of fourth grade, you're probably going to lose them uh, for STEM education. So there are initiatives ongoing to try and figure out how can we do this. So as an example, we have a collaboration with NVIDIA, with Intel, with a number of the, the IT companies to develop curricula to make this possible. It will be an open source curricula so that everybody can get access to it. If you have an internet connection, you can get access to it. Uh, and then uh, one, of our, one of our local people, Sara Nadiri, has developed this entire concept that's called sort of think a bit, where it's really about the, the maker movement. How do we not only make it about robotics, but how do we make it about build a you know, small Raspberry Pi to monitor my environmental monitoring or my water levels or things like that. So I think we should not be too narrow in our thinking. If we get them excited about STEM, I win. So or we win as a community. So I think that's very important. So we're seeing quite a number of initiatives. I think what we're lacking is sort of some level of coordination. So there's a forest of initiatives out there and some of them are really good and some of them are not so good. So I, so I think getting to really uh, understand how, how can we build, and that could be an area where it would be good to have an organization that really thinks about the, high, the right quality, the right material, and how do we distribute it to everybody. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, right. Let's have a look at some other questions. I've got two for Alice, actually. But first of all, I'm going to ask Andrea the question at the top here. Um, is a robot is the robot certified as a medical device? They'd be interested to know the safety and security standards and what's been used to operate in public environments. This might get a little technical, but don't worry. It sounds like they're ready for it. Yeah, so we are not certified as a medical device because um, very yeah, we we really design the workflows that that Moxie is doing to be not patient facing. Like so, we're not doing any direct patient care. We're not making any direct decisions about what patient should get what 
um, items. Um, we are, you know, explicitly trying to make it such that the, the hospital staff and the clinicians have more time for patient care. So we really are, you know, in the background doing delivery tasks so that, that the nurses and clinicians are spending more time with patients. And so that really um, takes the, the notion of, of us being a medical device off of the table. So then um, in terms of, of kind of security and, and other kinds of protocols, we do spend a lot of time with hospitals on information security and making sure that, you know, items and information about, you know, the things that we're transporting don't, um, that no patient information would get um, leaked accidentally or otherwise. So that I would say like a lot of our kind of um, compliance is around, you know, audit logs of, of who's been given what, uh, which staff member has been given what kind of items when and, and the information security around that. Brilliant. Thank you. Alice, I've got a couple of questions I can see about using deep learning techniques and the autopilot, what autopilot's being used. Would you like to do both of those at the same time? <laughs> Sure, I'd be happy to. It's really a discussion. Let me let me start with the, the autopilot question. There are a number of regulations associated with autopilot use of drones, if that's what the question is related to, and the need for line of sight. So for instance, in Israel, there is quite a developed autopilot pilot drone technology being developed there because there are regulations that are favorable to that. In the United States, the fire departments have to make exceptions to be able to use um, autopilot or use uh, aircraft that doesn't have line of sight. They need to be close enough to be able to follow the drone except for extreme emergencies. So it's, it's more of a regulatory situation than um, a technical problem. What was the second part of the question? Uh, the second one was about deep learning. What deep learning do you oh. use? Yeah, well, we with deep learning, there's no general algorithm that works on all data. So what we do is we try to collect enough sample data to do our data analytics. For instance, work we've done with the petrochemical industry, we've tried a number of deep learning algorithms for understanding and doing situation awareness and look at different factors to identify which deep learning algorithms are gonna be more effective. On the mobile robot, we've uh, used deep learning to identify what the most critical variables are in sensing for different contextual situations, but we don't use deep learning in real time. We use deep learning to provide insights for the proper gates for the robot. The, the robot is a shape shifting robot. In fact, maybe I've got a robot here. I wonder if I can show it on my other camera. Yeah, there it is. Okay, this is a squishy robot and it changes its shape by changing the length of the cable. So it can squeeze and become a tighter robot. It can get between rocks and we're changing the length of the cables to be able to change its shape. And so how we walk on rough surface is a kind of a gate. So we use machine learning to identify gates that are effective in different situations, but machine learning isn't fast enough in those situations to be able to use in real time as a couple of examples. But everything depends on the data and the, and, and the context that you're working in. I understand. So you're using almost simulation in real life and also in, um, in deep learning scenarios. And then when you're actually out in the field, it's got already th things that it knows will work on different scenarios. And, and to provide insight to humans. I mean, the, the transsecretary robot is so complicated. There are just so many degrees of freedom. And to be able to gain insights on proper gates that can be used in different situations and what the most important variables from a sensor are, um, can uh, humans can gain insight from the deep learning as well. Brilliant. Saeed, I'm, I believe you're also looking at deep learning and visual, visual recognition, visual applications. Yes, that is correct. Uh, we see uh, deep learning, especially in area of uh, uh, vision AI as a quite established uh, area. Uh, our systems uh, is big enough or powerful enough uh, to be able to handle the data, uh, data stream uh, online. So we use that uh, in real time as well. 
I think that's quite a common thing to run as many simulations as possible without having something out in the field so that so that you know what to do when it's uh, when it's all happening at once. And talking of all happening at once, we have another question here um, I can see for Henrik. What's what the big next steps of robotics in agriculture might be? And how are you able to reduce using pesticide usage, for example, in vineyards? Oh, that's a nice big question as well. Sure. No, no. So, so for for agriculture, I, I think we one of the big challenges we are seeing is actually access to workforce. So this used to be a very migrant area where you would have migrant workforce that would go to different places. During COVID, it's actually been hard for people to have this level of migration because of all of this. So there, there's a need for doing a higher level of automation. So as an example, we've been able to build. 3D grippers that can that can pick berries and pick uh, wine and, and so grapes. So so uh, by and we can do this by basically going in and so what Saeed was talking about before, building sort of a 3D model of the berries and use this to 3D print a gripper. So every different sort of uh, field can have a different gripping mechanism because we can 3D print it overnight and use it to actually do the, the, the gripping. And it's very important that we don't damage the berries because then they go from being fresh berries in the grocery store to being fruit juice. And the value of fruit juice is much lower than fresh berries. So that's an example. In terms of doing the, the pesticides, we, we are now at a point where we can use deep learning and other technologies to recognize what is wheat and what is actually valuable in the field and today, we've just seen that, for instance, you can use lasers and other technology to burn uh, wheat. So actually, rather than using pesticides, you're basically burning it. And that way, you're not contaminating the soil. So we can now drive through a wine field, recognize where the wheat is, kill the wheat without adding chemicals to uh, the fields, which is very important for the quality of the wine. So, so we're seeing this confluence of smart perception, smart gripper technology, and smart actuation that allows us to significantly change the business case. LJ, you're, you're muted. Mute. Sorry, I've got a new machine and I just have to press a button to mute and unmute. And, uh, and there you go. <laughs> I didn't press it that time. Thanks for letting me know. So I will just say what I was going to say this time with sound. I'm going to ask all of you in turn a question that's kind of that you can choose the answer to. And the question is, what one thing would you like to change? Or what challenge are you really proud of meeting? And the idea is then is that you can choose which question you'd most like to answer. And I'm going to start that with um, Andrea. So which one thing would you like to change? Or which challenge are you particularly proud of meeting? Ah, okay. Um, so I'll do the challenge. I think I am you know, really excited about having the, the challenge of putting robot autonomous robots working side by side with people and just getting into the messiness that is the kind of busy environments that people are around and the kind of dynamics that they create and getting robots, you know, away from these really structured tasks. 